we have submitted the paper to BioArchive last uh, last uh, Friday, and it was uh, it appeared online yesterday, yesterday at twelve, if I remember. So we're very excited about this paper because uh, it brings a lot uh, a lot of names you know well, a lot of people from Bovreg, a lot of people from Aquafang, a lot of people from Dean Switch. Most of the people who were actually involved in the development of uh, of pipelines. And it brings also together the NFCOR community. And that's one of the very big achievements of this paper, to bring together those who develop the framework for the pipeline and those who actually develop the pipeline, develop the content. And we have today with uh, us uh, Phil Ewell, who is uh, one of the active promoter of the NFCOR community. We have, of course, uh, Jose. And so uh, all of these people have been instrumental in making sure that the NFCOR community could gather the critical mass so that it can support all of this pipeline effort. So that's a very, very exciting development. And uh, 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 on the paper, you will see if you download it. So there is quite a lot of active tweeting about the paper. And there are a couple of, uh, you know, the figures have been shown at length, but this one we are especially proud about because it shows the level of connectivity associated with using NFCore tools where you have all of these uh, consortium, all of these fan consortium, Eurofan consortium that have been collaborating through using NFCore pipeline or even Nextflow pipeline. And it's really quite nice because it shows how, how much how much of a collective effort it has been to develop and to maintain this pipeline. So this is really exciting. Of course, we're excited to see that we did bet on the right horse because uh, the level of citations of Nextflow has been steadily increasing. So you can see people used to use only Galaxy and the user base of Galaxy is rock solid. You know, it's not changing, but more and more people are doing the kind of analysis we do. And as you can see, uh, uh, workflow managers, you know, common line workflow managers like uh, Nextflow and SnakeMake, they are becoming very, very widely used. They are the most widely used workflow managers these days. And we are, you know, we took personal pride in seeing that Nextflow is having such an increase. Why? Because, well, that's my theory, but I think DSL2, you know, the fact that you have can have modules in Nextflow now, I think it has been a very important game changer for a tool like Nextflow. And uh, 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 and so this paper is actually one of the nice uh, nuggets in this paper is that it is the first official publication of DSL2. So that was just me being a little bit cocky about this paper that is not yet accepted. We are we are spinning it actually. We are very we are we are we've been you know it's a game on this uh, on this uh, on this uh, preprints, but you can go to the metrics. And so if you go to the metrics, you can see if uh, what is the alt metric score of your paper. And the alt metric score is now 59 and it was 57 last time I looked up. So that's very high actually. That puts it in like the top five, one percent, you know. So it's quite uh, it's quite decent after 24 hours. And I think uh, 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 Phil, so Phil was really the leader of the last NFCore pipeline. I don't know if we will beat uh, the original NFCore, which was at 108, but you know, we, 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 we will see. So thanks a lot for, 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 for giving me these two minutes beyond. And, and without further ado, I will let you introduce today's speaker, Alex. Thank you. Yes, uh, we're pleased to have today with us Alessandro Bagnato from the Milano University, where he's a full professor and he is well known in the field of the quantitative genetics. And without any further ado, I will hand over and put the spotlight on you. Okay, thanks a lot, Bjorn. Um for inviting me to uh, present uh, um, a little bit of the activity that my group is uh, is uh, developing. Um, I thought a lot how to uh, do this presentation because the uh, field is very wide and uh, livestock genomics is uh, very broad and you guys are involved in uh, several uh, uh, European projects that are a step forward in uh, livestock genomics and in animal breeding. So. I ended up with a presentation that I will uh, give to you today um, and hope uh, you will be interested with some 
uh, where, where the animal breeding and, and genetic improvement start with. Uh, I got uh, also inspired from your TEDx, uh, Cedric, uh, in TEDx Barcelona of phenotype and longitudinal data, which are a, a core business of the livestock uh, uh, work that we are doing. So I don't take other time and uh, I try to share my screen. Um, can you? Okay, okay. So, um, I, I I will talk to you a little bit uh, of what is the livestock genomics uh, application that see that we envisage uh, are the ideas that we developed in 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 the last uh, years. Um, I start with the um, what was the 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 need for genetic improvement. Uh, um, usually, I, I use this slide with my students. You see that in age 60, when I, I was born in 61, we were 2.5 billion people. And in 50, 60 years, we became 8 million. So that's uh, due by different things, uh, um, condition of life, antibiotics, uh, whatever you can think uh, could affect. But uh, the, the community... Uh, the, the demand for the community was to um, need more feed, uh, more food to feed pe people. Okay, the, the population was growing and the need was feed all, increased food demand. But now in the age uh, that we are living, uh, we understand that we have finite resources. Uh, uh, and uh, finite resources means that our food production must uh, move uh, uh, towards uh, efficiency and sustainability. So what, what is our business? Uh, our business in the selection process is to identify individuals um, that are better than the mean so that they produce more or are better than the population averages uh, and uh, use them as a producer to create a new generation of individuals that are uh, better than the previous one. And uh, this is genetic improvement. So involved uh, several steps, reproduction and uh, and uh, <clears throat> use of animals in farms. But uh, what is the basic uh, uh, information we need is phenotype. We have to record the phenotypes and genealogical, <coughs> sorry, information. So pedigree. And this is uh, uh, the basic information to calculate, to predict the estimated breeding value, what is called EBV. Uh, just a, a small recap for those who are not part of this uh, business. And the EBV is the prediction of expected performance of the progeny. And this is genetic uh, one, is the additive genetic component. So how how... Uh, much is good the genome of an individual in creating a progeny that is better of the uh, previous generation. And this is was working very well in, in the year uh, as genetics and especially phenotypic selection, as we called, started really in age uh, 70 to age uh, 2010, because uh, at that age, uh, the quantitative genetics uh, with the uh, after Fisher and Lash with population genetics, uh, uh, we have the quantitative genetics. So uh, according to phenotype, measuring the phenotypes and with genealogical information, we were able solving system of equation to uh, say, take out the environmental effect on the phenotype and calculate the genetic component of the phenotype. So we were able to identify the superior individuals, let's say those with the uh, larger EBVs. Then we entered with the sequencing of the genome in the genomic era. So that was a, a change of paradigm because we now have genomic information, especially SMP chips uh, that uh, are low cost, uh, now are low cost, uh, 50K genotyping is uh, below 20 euro and uh, started the genomic era with the, the, the genomic selection, say with the male genotyping, and now we are in the female genotyping, but also DNA sequencing because costs are getting lower and lower. And so the livestock community uh, is, is starting to invest uh, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this part of uh, genomic data production. 
Is it a genetic improvement working well? Yes, this is uh, what you can see in terms of uh, changing phenotype and, and in uh, performance of uh, those are broilers, uh, 57, 78, 2005. And that's what's phenotypic selection. So based on solving system of equations uh, uh, for identify uh, animals carrying superior alleles, uh, cattle, you see a brown Swiss uh, um, female uh, in 50 years of selection, you see how the physiology has changed uh, of, of these animals. So delivering all energy to milk, because now is a, is a, say it was dual purpose, now is more milk. But now the challenge in this moment for us is to produce food uh, for all people in the globe using less resources. So we, we now have to produce food for 8 billion people. You have seen forecasting our to, to have 10 billion people in, in some times. And the uh, agri-genomics and livestock genomics uh, is, is becoming to have a crucial role because now we have a huge amount of information on individuals. And now we enter in the genomic uh, data analysis business and see what... Uh, um, I believe and my group believe uh, is, is, is our needs, especially for application of uh, genomic information. So a, a change of paradigm was uh, by Theo Mewissen, Ben Hayes and Mike Goddard uh, in 2001. So eight years before the sequencing of the cattle genome of prediction of total genetic uh, value using genome wide dense marker maps. Um, that's changed the, the paradigm because uh, uh, the genomic uh, EBV means that we can uh, calculate the expected performance of a progeny uh, of an individual just at the, at the birth of these individuals. So we can genotype, we can calculate the genomic EBV, and this is very accurate as information. So starting from 2010, uh, the genomic uh, uh, EBV became a reality in all species, pigs, chicken, uh, cattle, as soon as the whole genome sequence was, uh, was uh, available. And that's now the reality. Is it working? Yes, it's working. This is a, a, a paper from... Uh, Guyan uh, of 2023 that uh, does a retrospective analysis. So it shows uh, how much was the um, unit change uh, before the genomic selection. And that's the unit change with, uh, here it is the mouse, with, uh, with genomic selection. So uh, genomic selection, the use of genomic information, the possibility to identify which genes has been inherited by father and mother uh, from a, from an animals are um, a very interesting information because uh, improve the efficiency of the genetic progress of the progress in in production uh, in uh, individual. I like to stress out uh, something from year two thousand. The main goal in cattle. I'm working in cattle. That's because I, I'm I'm especially using example in cattle. Uh, the main goal in cattle is not to produce more, but uh, is to improve functionality of animals. Um, so the the main goal is to improve uh, mastitis resistance, resistance to disease, uh, fertility, uh, all traits that are related to the efficiency of production uh, of the fun functionality of the of the animals. The the increase in in production is not any more such a, a, an important uh, issue. Um, what's going on in population like Holstein is the largest uh, dairy uh, specialized population in the world. As you can see, um, the genotyping, you, you see genotyping of uh, uh, bulls um, born uh, many years ago, even if uh, we have the cheap genotyping from 2010 because semen was kept in uh, in nitrogen, in liquid nitrogen. So we had the genetic uh, material from the back, but now you see the female population start to be genotype. And this is a cha another change of paradigm. Um, why I say that? Because uh, I enter a little bit more in, in, the, in, the, in the needs. 
now we have a, a possibility to have uh, genotypes of all females of a herd. Um, it costs a uh, few money. Farmers start to understand that it's a big advantage uh, for them. So we started this project in 2019, if I'm correct, uh, and we genotype all the females of seven herds. Um, the beautiful thing is that also we have a, a large number of longitudinal phenotypes from sensors in farms. Uh, uh, sensors are becoming a reality in all farms. Uh, so we have automatic milking system, milking robots, basically. Uh, cows are uh, entering the milking robots when they feel they, they must be milked. So uh, also they have a pedometer sensor to see how much they move uh, every day and rumination data sensor to see how much they, if the rumination timing is uh, okay or whatever. So they are basically, basically controlled three, four times uh, per day. So we have a recording of data three, four times per day. Then we also have in the farms uh, measuring temperature, humidity, to monitor heat waves and relate uh, change in production according to climate change, which is another issue. And the 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 change that we have that is that now we can have large number of animals with phenotypes and genotypes. So that's a change. Before in cattle we were having only males, but now we have females on which we can record uh, um, a large number of of uh, uh, information. Um, what we did with this uh, with this data, I just we did several things, but uh, I like to show you a couple of uh, of uh, possibility. Um, we started to work with the uh, engineers. Uh, this guy uh, is collaborating with us now. He's doing a PhD in data analytics and decision science. So interaction with different disciplines, uh, and uh, um, he uh, was very interesting. So he developed a machine learning in genomic prediction and phenomenic forecasting. So using the data, the longitudinal data from milking robots and the genotypes that we have on all the cows of this farm, Andrea developed uh, a system to uh, forecast the uh, lactation curves. So this is the lactation curve. Okay, this is the um, starting of lactation of a cow, and uh, uh, then up to four hundred and, and several days. This is the average of all the cows uh, that uh, that uh, he was uh, studying, and he applied the machine learning uh, uh, techniques uh, to uh, cow by cow. Um, um, guess what will be the future production. Uh, when the female has one month of age. So he was using the genomic EBV, the genomic information, was using uh, uh, information on the herd, on predicted uh, date of uh, calving, and uh, the, the capabilities to give a, a forecast of what will be the future production in, in kilograms of milk of each cow. And of course, we use kilogram of milk, but we can also forecast... Uh, uh, other traits like longevity, like uh, resistance to mastitis, uh, like uh, fertility. And uh, this was recently published in Computers and Electronics in Agriculture. And on the right, you see the the, the average uh, uh, of the error, the error average. And you see that the linear model, the, the contrast, the comparison was done with linear models that is the the useful um, usage of, of uh, prediction of ABV. And you see that is lower. We are keep working on this. So it's just a, a, a word that started uh, some, some time ago. But uh, according to a uh, word that was developing one of the European projects and published by Popper, we are, are using also the day-by-day -day information to identify the genetic basis of resilience and efficiency. We take advantage that we have genotype uh, of all cows uh, um, of this herd, and we have uh, um, longitudinal data day by day of uh, milk production, temperature of milk, uh, uh, length of uh, milking, a huge amount of data recorded by milking robots. And you see here, you have two different uh, uh, lactation curves. This is an interpolation of what can be the, um, say, interpolated lactation. And you see this uh, cow on the left, uh, 
has a, a, a decrease in milk heat wave, mastitis, infection, whatever it is, but it takes long time to recover this uh, per environmental uh, perturbance. So it's not really a cow capable to recover uh, an environmental issue. Um, and this is a, a measure of resilience. So how much this cow is able to recover? much less than the one on the right, that um, having a perturbance here is able in two, three days to recover and keep uh, going and go back to the to the previous production. Now, this deals with the longitudinal data, but we also have genotype, and together with the approach of uh, Andrea before machine learning, we can also uh, identify uh, what what can be the resiliency of these uh, individuals and we want to we, we are working on this we are starting to work of this this is a, a national project that will uh, run up to 25 and another Andrea one of the guys that you have seen here um, is working on on this for his PhD program to relate the genomic information with uh, with this. And this is a, a level of complexity that uh, is increasing because uh, we have many longitudinal data, uh, genomic information uh, with, with complexity that is increasing. Uh, that's just to see that the area is uh, what we can use to calculate the loss. Um, genomic data. Genomic data can be used uh, also uh, to uh, understand uh, what the biodiversity in terms of breeds we, we can have. Um, Francesca that is at CRG now is working uh, on the Aosta population. That's a breed that I'm, I'm, I like a lot because uh, um, this breed uh, migrated in the Aosta Valley with the Burgundy in 1,500 years ago. And basically, Aosta Valley is a large valley, but is isolated. It is not uh, having exchange. So we have 1,500 year, years of uh, adaptation of this breed to the environment. Um, what I'm interested in, um, okay, this breed uh, um, say that the, the, the selection was pressure was not so strong. It's a double purpose for meat or or milk, um, something that the farmers always kept uh, uh, looking for uh, is the ability of these cows to uh, cope with the harsh climatic condition of summer pasture. Uh, they go in summer pasture, um, and uh, the pasture summer pasture is from May to late September. They have to deal with the uh, uh, environment that is a uh, kind of high mountain uh, from 1,000 to 2,000 and something uh, meters above level. So uh, say something that we are trying to investigate is what is the impact of the natural environment versus artificial environment in terms of the evolution of the genome of these individuals? So if you if you think in terms of, or of uh, Darwinian uh, um, evolution, um, the artificial environment is uh, something that is built to give the better productive condition to animals. So they have a, a personal uh, bed, as I usually say. They have feed at libitum. Um, they have fun. Uh, the goal here is that the cow is in the best uh, condition to produce more. So what is the cow that is most adapted to this artificial environment? The one that is able to produce more, the one that is able to use this uh, artificial environmental condition to adapt. And adaptation is uh, don't get uh, ill, don't get infection, uh, react to mastitis, um, be fertile uh, when inseminated. So the cow that never give a problem. But if I take one of these cows, Hosten, and I put in the uh, summer pasture, they cannot cope with this environment. Uh, they wait much more. They are bigger. Uh, they, they cannot cope with this environment. Uh, so these girls here, they, they 
have adapted to the environment. Uh, in, in some way, uh, the hypothesis is that uh, the adaptation here is uh, much more related to the environment that they have to deal with during summer. So we started uh, to look at another class of market with this, with, which is copy number variant. Uh, it's another class of variant. We started to look at them in quantomics, Cedric. If you if you remember, that was one of the of the steps of quantomics. Uh, um, so we kept going with this. Uh, we had now we have now much more information from SMP uh, chips uh, from uh, whole genome sequence data. Uh, more in Holstein, but uh, now we also have in, in the Valdostana starting from now, okay? And uh, if you go and look in in, uh, in publication, you see that uh, a copy number variant uh, at least appear to be related uh, versus a, a quick adaptation to environmental condition. For example, the uh, starch diet in dogs. Uh, uh, it's a it's a paper that uh, usually I use. Uh, they they studied the the duplication and the the copy number uh, related to the uh, starch diet uh, in dogs. Uh, I don't want to 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 just uh, give you a lecture of what copy number has. I think you know much better than than me. Um, what we try to do, just as an example of what we we are developing, this is has not been published now. Uh, we try to see the difference in in uh, with a very simple uh, principal component analysis of uh, the three Valdostana, the three Aosta cattle. This is the red one, red pied, and this is the Castana, the chestnut, and the and the black. So if we use SMPs as a markers. Uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, we are able to differentiate this breed. So you you see in every study that we have done, also including Brown or also including Holstein, that you can see that they are a group of individuals, red pie, and another group of individuals. But uh, if we start to um, use copy number variants uh, to see if these breeds are um, different or not, uh, um, we see another another situation. So those are the same individuals that you see here in, uh, in SMPs are the same one. But uh, if we um, see how they uh, cluster using copy number variant and copy number variant region, we see that is a, a unique uh, cloud. They do not differentiate uh, according to breed. But if we get into the picture Holstein, we see that Holstein differentiate very well. Um, Holstein, uh, uh, in terms of copy number variants, uh, differentiate by these three breeds. So what we are trying to, to identify if the hypothesis, uh, natural environment versus artificial environments is playing a role in the copy number variant uh, evolution of the genome of these uh, populations. Uh, here at the Austin, you see these uh, are the, um, the region uh, with annotated genes. So there is an annotation of genes in this region and how many are in common. Uh, um, I don't want to get into the annotation and what genes are annotated, but that's the hypothesis that we are trying to develop. Okay, there was a microphone. Um, and and so the, the interesting thing is that uh, we want, this was done with the SMP chip, but we want to uh, shift to use whole genome sequence uh, uh, of individuals. Um, and uh, we are trying to do this shift with this uh, project that just started is the one where Francesca is also involved. Uh, um, that's related to estimation of genomic ABV in the autochthonous Aosta population, uh, who is in the business of uh, genomic estimations, uh, knows very well that uh, prediction equation that works in Austin don't want uh, don't work in 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 Brown, and they don't want they don't work work sorry they don't work in in other in other populations so each population has 
their specific set of uh, prediction equation. And in my view is because the evolutionary history of the genome is different breed to breed according to the environment and to the historical uh, evolution. Uh, also with the artificial selection that these population have uh, undergone. So here, uh, beside uh, to, to having a goal uh, to, est to, estim to, to um, a step forward in, in the genomic ABV estimation, we now have 10,000 uh, uh, individuals genotype. Uh, so it's a reasonable uh, uh, number to uh, start this business. We also want to understand what is the peculiar genomic variation uh, of this breed with respect to other breeds in terms of SMPs, copy number variant, in the, all the structural variability that we can um, identify and see if we can identify peculiar variation with the uh, natural environment they are found with. Uh, and here we can discuss uh, for, for a long time. Um, from where this comes. Uh, you, Cedric, remember very well this project. Uh, um, and uh, this project was changing a lot my vision of, of research because it uh, uh, was a project that uh, bring together the bioinformatics side. That was an idea of Chris' uh, workup. Um, the bioinformatics and Chris uh, Halley also from, from Rosling. Um, having three pillars, uh, tools to exploit genomes uh, through an identification of function, uh, tools to exploit genomes through association with traits, uh, and then integrated breeding uh, tools to combine all genomic information. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, project. We started to work together to understand uh, each other as because before we were kind of two separated worlds. Uh, I knew nothing of bioinformatics. I was uh, entering the bioinformatic era, but I knew nothing. I was uh, doing genetic evaluation with linear models, uh, solving a system of equations. Um, then I set up a molecular lab. I learned all the difficulties of uh, and the impact from DNA extraction to the to to the data that you you analyze. But especially after that project, we tried several times to set up other projects, quantumomics, uh, Otre. Uh, and the, the basic idea was that uh, given the reduction in cost, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can try to relate the um, structural variation through the phenotypes. Uh, uh, but using other uh, indicators, because we have a transcriptome, we have other, what we call internal indicators, uh, we can have metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics. Uh, um, now another piece was the epigenetic variation, so the DNA status. And one of the things that we were um, um, thinking in this, uh, in this uh, uh, contest is that uh, um, we are having, uh, and now here I enter a little bit in what I think is uh, is would be very useful uh, to PhD student or new researcher that uh, have the biological uh, understanding of uh, livestock genomics, but not uh, the the skill of bioinformatics or as Andrea of the engineering uh, at the polytechnics. We are having a huge number of uh, SMP genotypes uh, now. All the females in in herds are started to be genotyped, so we will we will have tens, hundreds of millions of of genotypes, and and that create a problem of reduction of uh, of uh, uh, numbers in in, in uh, who is doing genetic evaluation, and that's a business. But we start to have also a huge number of whole genome sequence uh, because. Uh, research project are uh, sequencing a local population where there was no economic interest. Think about that we have a huge amount of local population uh, in in, uh, Al Alpa in in mountain or 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 hill uh, in all uh, in all countries. Uh, but now with with uh, some uh, research money we have whole genome sequence, 
and other genomic data are being more and more produced. And the other thing is that we have longitudinal data. Sensors in farms, uh, I, I'm impressed in the last two, three years, the numbers of, of data that I have from farms uh, uh, by sensors uh, and uh, the upper project we are also collaborating with other people who is uh, installing other sensor to to get other longitudinal data then we have artificial intelligence uh, neural network uh, machine learning technology that we can apply and uh, a large availability of genomic data and you know very well as Fang, uh, where there are a, a large number of, of projects that is contributing. So we, we have database of, uh, we start to have pan genomes. Uh, we want to do pan genomes also in the Valdostan, uh, chromatin accessibility data, phenotype collection, a huge number of data, metadata that are, are there available. And in my mind is how can we benefit of all this data that are underused and how can we use this data to prove some hypothesis that uh, is related to the biology of population. Um, one of the advantage that we, we were thinking in one of these uh, projects submitted, and I think this is a big advantage with respect to the human, uh, human uh, uh, say community, um, is that in animals uh, we can produce different data on the same individuals. Uh, so we have animals in control environment because they are in farms or even in experimental farms. Uh, and we can produce uh, uh, data that uh, spans from structural genome to epigenome to functional genomes. And uh, these two pictures are from uh, one, uh, one uh, submitted proposal uh, together with other scientists, uh, UK and, and other scientists. Um, but uh, but uh, what I want to stress is the fact that uh, uh, we we if we have sufficient money, we can produce these different layers of uh, of uh, genomic information on the same individuals. This is something that in human uh, community I think is not really possible for ethical reason for uh, other reason, and the complexity for analyzing this data is is much much higher than 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 what my community i would never be able to develop something like that but that's that's one of the reasons why i i asked francesca to come to to barcelona and to start to work with nf core because i think that nf core and the next flow uh, can give uh, an impressive benefit uh, to young scientists uh, because the the from a research uh, point of view, people like Francesca, PhD student, can be enormously facilitated if uh, they can find uh, uh, pipelines to analyze this data, uh, huge amount of data uh, in in uh, in in a simple way. Um, we can do biological hypothesis. We can do uh, biological interpretation, but. Uh, we need uh, the bioinformatics uh, community uh, to allow us to put together this uh, huge amount of data that uh, by ourselves we would never be able to 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 analyze. Um, so that's why I see, at least I liked a lot uh, the the next flow and of course I found it. Uh, uh, I browse a little bit. It's very easy to. To do because at least I didn't read the paper, uh, Cedric, that you show. But I think is a is a possibility to build on top of others. So it's modular and and uh, and can can handle very well this complexity. From application point of view, the questions that we have open there are other markers in addition to SMPs that we can use in genomic selection to make these selection of individual more efficient uh, and think about it if we can have a more efficient production uh, that's more sustainable because impact less the environment that's the the business of, of people doing selection um also we were thinking about copy number variant and then the discussion was uh, is epigenetics playing a role in selection yes or no discussion open 
should we prioritize SMPs now the genomic selection is based only on SMPs? Should we prioritize SMPs uh, for traits? Uh, for example, um, if we want to select for longevity production uh, resistance to disease, uh, should we produce different chips or prioritize uh, our um, uh, GABB estimation according to the traits we are looking for in SMPs. Should we develop specific SMP chips per each breed, but we need a, a whole genome sequence because now the SMP chips are kind of working on a wide spectra, spectrum of, of breeds are not as breed specific. And what would uh, can we do if, if we want to shift from SMP data to whole genome sequence data if they will become so cheap that that also say that, that the farmer community will start to uh in not a close future but uh, start to sequence as some females individuals I, I i talk about uh farmers in in cattle because selection for uh poultry and for swine is done in in house there are big companies large companies that are uh, working on on this uh, genomic application and then uh, another step forward and i want to finish with this is a cost action that's uh, that's just uh, started um the start date was september 23 will will uh, last uh, till 27 is hided but is 27 um, that's a European uh, cost action. I think this is a very good container uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, all these topics because as you know, uh, the coordinator is Luca Fontanese from uh, Bologna. Um, there is a large uh, group of uh, contributors and the work package is phenotyping technologies, uh, uh, genome to phenome integration, computational resources and methodologies for data analysis. You see, this is one of the topics that uh, that the livestock community is uh, is dealing with and, and is exactly fitting the, the, the bioinformatic uh, tools that you guys are working with. Economic uh, impact regulation policies and society. Uh, should we use CRISPR-Cas9 for... Uh, uh, gene editing in uh, in cattle, for example, to uh, do polled uh, individuals, but that goes into combination with uh, uh, cloning or or uh, embryo technologies. Uh, so th th there is an impact. So um, the keywords are livestock genomics, phenotype breeding, and big data. And if you're not part of this community, I encourage you to, to become part of the community because I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, action uh, to uh, keep moving forward with the, what I try to, to present you today. today. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you a lot for the talk. Um, just to continue with a small teaser on this one, it's actually very interesting that you mentioned the cost action. We are planning to have a talk on this one in July. Um, but with this, I would go into the questions. Um, anyone can unmute themselves or you write the questions in the chat. If I can just make a comment before we start, the idea Please. is that we start with, uh, with the most straightforward question and we gradually drift towards something that will be more of a discussion with the speaker. So if you have uh, precise questions and more generic question, I will suggest you to start with the most precise questions and then you know, we everybody will have a bit of time to to ask their question. Alex, this was an amazing talk. This really was a great overview. Now we know why we will not be starving. And 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 really, <laughs> thanks a lot. I I have a I have a very naive question. So, uh, the quantitative genetics you are discussing here can be applied directly to plants as well, or. or are these two communities living a little bit side by side, or is it is there really a, 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 a commonality? 
No, no, the, the quantitative genetics approach can be used uh, as well in, in plant. They they do it. Uh, they have a big advantage with respect to animals. They they have a phenotyping station. So they have big phenotyping station in which they can uh, uh, challenge, uh, say, uh, plants uh, for uh, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, soil, chemical characteristics, uh, uh, hours of light, so they they can uh, uh, relate uh, the genomic variation to the phenotypic variation in a much better and more precise uh, way. And for example, um, in in livestock, uh, what what we are trying to do is a sire that fits all the environments, uh, especially in in uh, in Holstein. So you you produce the ABV. For sires and these sires is used in in different environments. They are more or less standard. But uh, if you think at the at the New Zealand, uh, they they uh, they are in free stalls. It's a different uh, environment. What they do in in plant in maize, for example, uh, they they produce uh, hybrids uh, that are uh, specific for soil uh, characteristics, for temperature characteristics. So things into USA, county by county, they may have different uh, genetic uh, uh, basis for their, their plants. So plant science, also in genomic uh, ABV estimation, uh, is exactly in, in the same situation. Um, it's very interesting. I don't know if you ever called uh, Cedric, uh, uh, but I think you, you came in the Plant and Animal Genome Conference in San Diego. There, there are the two communities, and there is a, it's a very good place where to also compare what what's uh, common on, on the community. And of course, uh, in plant and animals, you do selection, and that's the different uh, uh, big difference with with human. Uh, I, I was just wondering because plants have this, you know, domesticated plants have these tendencies to duplicate their genome, which well, fish have this a little bit, but that. And I was wondering if this results in, you know, it's still the same, it's still genetics, but but if there are qualitative differences that, that do not apply from one to the other, but uh, and uh, uh, well 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 while well, people are warming up, we have quite a nice audience today, much nicer than last week actually, great. So I uh, so I'm sorry jumping into something that may sound like a discussion, but uh, so uh, one of the purpose of this special interest group is to identify topics that will be of interest to the whole community as sort of inspiration. And so on one side, obviously, you have everything that is human, because uh, a lot of things start in human where there is more money. And so you will have encode in human. And then after encode in human, people say, well, this will be nice to, to do this on farm animal. And rather than having just one farm animal, you have all of them and you start being able to do comparative genomics. And you highlight very, very nicely that when you can do this, then you have to use the same tools. Otherwise, you cannot really compare your data. And so human is inspirational because it is telling us, if you had a lot of money, here is what you can do. And since everything will be 10 times cheaper in five years, yes, you will be able to do it. And then you have the other side, which I had not realized. Do you think, and that's for the special interest group, do you think that plant is showing an area of genetics where we cannot go with animals because of all the shortcomings you were telling and that plant genetics could be an inspiration of new things to do in animal genomics? Um, that's, I don't know, Cedric, uh, because the, the, the complexity and the specificity specificity of, of plant genetics, uh, it's a little bit different from, from animal uh, genetics, uh, like uh, especially there is selection in, in potato, in tomato, uh, which are also potato, especially are based on another, let's say, reproductive system. Also, their their reproductive system is is, uh, is different. I, I think that the the human genetics is really uh, providing a lot of development in tools in lowering the cost. Uh, and and uh, in allowing the the, the livestock uh, uh, community to use this uh, this uh, situation, 
Uh, one of the of the projects we were developing was having as a objective uh, reverse the flow of information from animals to human, and and uh, that was the the start of the encode project in human. And I think that one of the really advantage with, that we should uh, use, um, I think that the the mouse community probably uh, is working on this. I'm not in the mouse community, but in terms of food production, is a uh, would be very helpful to understand which genes are controlling specific uh, uh, features of of food production. I mean our. And, and the fact that you can produce a wide number of uh, genomic data from RNA-seq, uh, uh, ChIP-seq, ATAC-seq data uh, related to whole genome sequence structural variation, I think can improve a lot uh, in the near future, the efficiency of selection of individuals. And why I'm saying that? Because the really the challenge, you know how much the animal uh, community, the production of food from animals is under, uh, I don't want to say attack, but is under uh, the light uh, in terms of uh, polluting the planet, using resources. But as I say, we have to, we have to eat. Uh, uh, we cannot say, like uh, I, I showed the first uh, slide, we cannot say to half of the people of the of the earth, hey, listen, we don't want to pollute the world. Uh, you, you will not have food starting from today. I'm not going to say that to anybody. So really the, 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 the problem is to make the production more efficient, efficient and everything starts from the, from the genome. Um, if I can... Uh, produce one kilos of milk uh, using uh, one and a half kilos of food instead of two kilos, then I'm using less land, I'm using less water, I'm using less resources. So that's what I think the, the animal and human communities are more related than plant because plant has a different system. I'm not in the, in the, in the plant business. So maybe there is some someone from the plant community here in the, in the audience. It can add uh, some. Silva has a comment or a question. Uh, yes, maybe I can propose a, a question. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, Sylvain Fossac uh, from Inray, and I was um, I was curious about your opinion on phenotyping um, because, as you showed, uh, breeding has been focusing for a long time on very specific traits. Uh, usually productivity of milk or meat or whatever. And uh, with all the the issues like uh, un environmental or ethical issues that we are facing today, um, now we are uh, uh, shifting the, the goal of only productivity to sustainability and and resistance to diseases or stress and so on. Uh, but those traits are often complex to capture. And so you 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 showed how uh, longitudinal data could be uh, used on still using those specific productivity traits to um, to to get a bit. Uh, further, I would say, uh, what kind of other phenotypic, um, yeah, phenotypes uh, are the keys, for, uh, in your opinion, for for the, for the for the future challenges? Okay, um, thanks, Sylvain. Um, th th that's a very uh, complex situ situation. Okay, um, I think that the 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 breeding was working very well for major. 82 today was based on uh, a recording of uh, phenotypes. We have the the international system to do milk recording system. That was why it was very easy. Um, and that was uh, the basis of improvement of, of uh, amount of food. Okay. Now, something that uh, uh, I always try to also say to my colleagues, in 2001, there was a co cost action that was called GIFT. Um, genetic improvement of functional traits. So starting that age, uh, uh, the 
cow community, the, the cattle community started to shift from uh, increased amount of uh, food to improve longevity, improve resistance to mastitis. And of course, we didn't have the, the possibility of sensor, sensor data that we have today. Now, how to use this? First of all, we have an amount of longitudinal data that is impressive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I worked uh, uh, on, on the milk recording system, but we had one record every month. Here, we have uh, three records every day, four records. It depends how many times the cow entered the, the milking robot. So we can monitor the cow as, I, I don't I don't have a comparison in in uh, in in other in other situation. Now, what it, the 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 resilience, the capability of individuals to recover or to cope with the harsh environmental um, uh, condition um, is not an easy trait, as you say, to to measure. Now we can have very good indicators. Uh, the the graphs that I show you comes from the work that you have done. Um, I think he's a colleague of you in one of the European projects. I don't remember if it is Geronimo or, uh, or. I mean, either. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. But anyway, anyway, um, that is based on longitudinal data. That's, that's exactly an approach that is based on longitudinal data on the fact that we have day by day, three, four times per day. A, a, a phenotype from a cow, and we can put together these these uh, phenotypes. Something else that I that I learned uh, looking at this uh, huge amount of data is that uh, uh, this lactation curve. So the the how the the production. I realize it that is much different of lactation course of thirty years ago. So all the uh, assumption that we were having in management of cow 30 years ago, they have to change because we are learning a lot of, uh, we are learning a lot on how cow is now producing. And uh, the fact that we can have the longitudinal data can also uh, allow us to manage the, the animals in a much more different way. Um, so I think that the, that, uh, the more, this, this, the sensor, the longitudinal data that I see is from milking robots, from uh, temperature, from humidity, from how much they move. Uh, uh, there are other sensors that uh, that we are can use. For example, 3D, uh, three-dimensional camera, a camera that record the temperature of the other system. Uh, in poultry, they are using uh, artificial intelligence uh, monitoring the the movement of of uh, of animals. So as soon they see that they move in a different way, they understand that there is an infection. So I think this is to to be explored how we can use these uh, longitudinal data from uh, sensors and uh, from analysis of uh, of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I think that they can provide a phenotypes that uh, if we can uh, identify as a as a number or as a quantitative number, then we can relate to the genomic uh, information. But this is to be explored. That's one of the goals that we have with the the project that uh, is ongoing. And maybe we have to start from from uh, small uh, uh, data and then see if they can be ex expanded. I don't know if I gave you a, a. Yes, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting, and also maybe starting from small data or for very uh, curated, expertised exactly. data sets, right? Exactly. Actually, we are working now in a farm in two farms uh, where we have milking robots, and and the farmer is really open, so it's allow us to to access all the data and uh, and to put sensors and uh, and it's very collaborative is it's also i i find that the feed i would not call it feedback but the inputs from farmers uh, is becoming very interesting to to develop uh, knowledge that is used for for uh, increased efficiency of food production Patrick. Thank you, you, you for this. 
Well, th th thank you for this very interesting development. I, I wanted to bounce back on uh, on these longitudinal things. You know, I have a, I have a special thing for longitudinal analysis. Actually, Jose, who is on the call here, developed uh, uh, a hijacking of uh, of genome brothers to uh, to display and zoom in in uh, longitudinal phenotypes a long time, quite quite some time ago. But overall, one of the things I find quite exciting is that. And this is a vested interest of us on the NF call side. It's a lot of data. It's almost as much data as a genomic data. And in fact, you know, if you think of one recording every second, and if you are recording on the number that goes from zero to 1,000, then before you know it, you are collecting chunks of data that, has, uh, that are as large as genomes. What do you think of the challenges in the future? Is it something? And that will be really one of the potential focus of this group. Is it a new generation of pipeline that need to be developed that should harmonize the handling of this longitudinal data? What do you think something should be done in this direction? Uh, my my opinion is yes, because uh, uh, what I see is uh, what, what we are facing now is that we have uh, the dimensionality of data is exploding. So the the big data, what how is it called? The, the dimensionality is really exploding. So the 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 thing is that um, we have two 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 steps that are moving. The the fact that we have a huge phenotypic and environmental data collected and is day by day, even uh, many times per day. But the other thing is that we start to have genomic information, which is another dimensionality problem, uh, on uh, all cows. Now, the fact is that before we were genotyping maize and we were using maize with artificial insemination to uh, uh, for the diffusion of the, the, the genes in the female population in the next generation. Now we don't we, now we, we have genotypic information, genomic information on the female. So I think that farmers, that's one of the goal that we are having with the project with the farmers. How can they match the longitudinal data with the genomic information that they have on the cow? And we tried uh, uh, to develop uh, some uh, service for them, um, and they are positive. They 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 told us that the uh, uh, coupling of genomic information with the analysis of longitudinal data allowed them to select uh, to identify animals and to manage animals in a better way. Uh, but that's all to be explored, uh, Cedric. But if you ask me, there is need, yes. For, I mean, to me, there is a huge need to, to match the large amount of longitudinal data with the genomic data because are too, too, too big a uh, yeah, um, yeah. group of data uh, that mm -hmm. they, they, they must be matched together. Um, I can give you another example. The community of poultry are selecting the 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 broiler that are growing faster. That's one of the of the goal. So the 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 growing of the broiler, but uh, the the phenotyping is recorded in cages because they have individual by individual big cages, but they have an individual. But then they have a very few correlation with the uh, uh, growth when they are on the ground because the the environmental situation is different competition uh, is uh, what is affecting this only competition or some gene activated i don't know uh, i mean this is these are the challenges of of the future Cedric. but uh, but uh, the answer but, definitely uh, for me is yes because that's really interesting because, uh, as you know, in, in human, you know, there's a lot going on on GTEx and on uh, uh, correlating images with uh, yeah. uh, genotypic data. And, and of course, you want to go further. You want to look at uh, image behaviors. And I understand from Phil that this is a fast growing area of NFCore image analysis. Lots of people are now putting new pipelines and obviously, that, that uh, one can think that uh, longitudinal analysis, uh, uh, and that's why I wanted to feel impression on this, but longitudinal analysis could be an interesting 
a, a new area of growth for NFCO pipeline, something that could be interest to a growing community because longitudinality is everywhere. You get human data that is being recorded every second day. I know that mobile phone companies are crazy about this kind of thing. So, Phil, do you know if there is anything in NFCore? Is there any sub community interested in longitudinality? Uh, no, this is the first time I've had this one brought up that I can think of, but there's, yeah. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Doesn't mean that it's not, uh, not an interesting thing to perceive. And you know, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to make a, a quick comment that can open to a discussion. So as some of you know, most of you probably, but I don't know if all of you know this because I was surprised. I had not realized. So the doubling time of genomic data has been decreasing steadily for about 20 years. You know, everybody hear about Moore's law, and Moore's law is about the fact that the doubling time of the computers has been the same for about 40 years, not in biology. In biology, the doubling time is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And interestingly, last year, the doubling time of computers has crossed the doubling time of genomic data, which means that since last year, we will be less and less able to analyze all the data we generate. And, and that is opening up new, fascinating, uh, 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 possibilities because uh, in reality we do this all the time. Our brain, our eyes, you know, our senses capture much more data than our brain is able to handle. And our brain guesses, imputes a lot of the data. And imputation is nothing new to geneticists. They have known for a long time that if you have models powerful enough, you can impute. And so my question to you is: Are we going toward a situation where we are going to keep acquiring? more and more data, but we will not necessarily analyze this data. We will re-impute it because it will be easier and go back to the raw data every once in a while to make sure that imputation is taking place correctly. That, that's, a, that's a possibility, Cedric. Uh, the, 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 the dimensionality problem is, is, is arriving. Uh, I mean, uh, the engineering that developed the that uh, forecasting of, of the lactation, first thing, get into the di dimensionality problem. He started to use the all the single SMP genotype that we were having on each cow, but then it was a problem. But also what you say is that, uh, I, I think that, yes, uh, I agree with you. We will go back to the to the time by time on the original data. But it's not possible according to what I can see, but then I don't know. It may be that uh, the quantum uh, computing will become a reality. I don't know. <laughs> Some friend of my physics, theoretical physics, they say that is not a good, we realize. Someone say yes, I don't know. I, I, I don't have uh, any possibility to, to say yes or no, but... Uh, as far as the, the data is exploding, uh, the dimensionality problem, what we will use, uh, it's it will become an issue. So how to choose the data? How? What are the key uh, information that uh, should we use to inform, uh, uh, I don't know, farmers on their, cho on their choice or uh, selection or imaging for, uh, for detecting uh, uh, illness or or, or uh, situation uh, to 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 be uh, identified for tomography, whatever. Uh, that's that's another issue according to to what I can see, Cedric. Yes, I'm I'm, uh, I'm starting uh, to get old, so uh, not having the the hands on data by myself is just making my opinion a guess or or a belief <laughs> on what i can see on what uh, other people is doing and, and from the discussion you know it's something my friends doing metagenomics are telling me something i had not realized we cannot search metagenomics data anymore it's too big you cannot you cannot do a blast on all the genomic data that has been produced it's just too large a data set so we need to invent new ways of searching data. And when it comes to phenotypic data, it will be even harder to search. And uh, uh, I have one last question, uh, unless anybody has a question. 
and this is out of curiosity. So uh, I was, uh, 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 well, uh, I heard a talk by Gene Myers not so long ago, where he was explaining that now the combination of PacBio and Illumina is so good that if you give a human genome, you come back with 46 contigs. <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are, you know, your maternal and paternal haplotypes. And that's it. Uh, uh, is this to have an impact on, uh, on, on, on farmed animal genomics, genetics? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, I mean, in terms of reference genome, they have been uh, redone in 2018 using a combination of PacBio and, uh, and Illumina. Um, I'm, I'm, we are planning now to do, for example, pan genome uh, for the Valdostana. The prices are decreasing. I think that this will have an impact uh, also in the in the community. I think, for example, that if we can uh, uh, do the novel sequencing breed by breed, uh, we can understand a lot of the complexity of the structural genome, for example. And uh, and we can create, for example, tools specific breed by breed. Uh, I think that the that's a belief, uh, not a belief. It's a guess, uh, Cedric. To explore with with what we are doing, also with Francesca, I think that the um, evolution of the genome of local population uh, adapted to specific environment is really different from what uh, occurred in the, in the host end. Uh, the effective number of the host end population that is the largest in the world is a few hundred, 100, 200, according to estimation. So it's much less than a smaller population. Uh, so the the the, the technology is impacting enormously what we can we can uh, do in uh, in livestock. Uh, the the livestock community is arriving after because the money is not uh, uh, as much uh, available as as uh, in human, and uh, that's that's the only reason. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, uh, actually, we are one of the plan next year is to invite a representative of the primate pan genome, which I have found to be one of the most exciting and, and amazing projects of these last years. And I can imagine that uh, the the ruminant pan genome will be as exciting for your community as yeah. the primate pan genome has been for human. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Alessandro, thanks a lot for, for this great and extremely inspirational talk. I don't see any more hands raised. And so I guess we've been online for over an hour now, which is uh, uh, a lot of Zoom. Alex, thanks a lot. This is really, I see some hands clapping. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this was uh, very, very, this was exactly in line of the kind of talks we'd like to host on this channel, because uh, it's at the same time very broad and at the same time, very specific on some topic. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot You're so for, welcome, for, guys. for being a speaker. Thank you so Thank much you. for inviting me and uh, for, for uh, listening. <laughs> thanks a lot. And also for the comment and the questions that allow me to give you at least some uh, crazy idea that uh, uh, we have in mind.